Throughout history, there has been a persistent trend of individuals falsely claiming to predict the exact date of the second coming of the Lord or the rapture. This phenomenon represents a significant deception related to end times, where people are misled by these false prophets. It's crucial to recognize and be vigilant against this type of deception, as it can lead people astray. The truth is, the specific timing of these events remains unknown, with no one having the knowledge of the exact day or hour. We recently received an email with the subject, Reasons Why Jesus Christ Will Return in 2024. The sender provided extensive details on why they believe Jesus will return in 2024. However, let this serve as a caution to the body of Christ. We should refrain from specifying dates for Jesus' return. Regarding his coming, Jesus said in Matthew 24, 36, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. For the last 2,000 years, almost every year without fail, a pastor somewhere or a prophet somewhere has predicted the specific day that the end will come and Jesus will return. Do not, and I repeat, do not, engage in the practice of setting dates for the Lord's return. The timing of the Lord's return is beyond your pay grade and my pay grade. Venturing into the realm of setting exact dates is to wander into dangerous territory. Indeed, we can observe signs of the end times all around us. Natural, spiritual, sociological, technological, and political indicators all suggest that we are living in the end times. However, recognizing these signs does not grant us the authority to start setting dates. Natural signs of the end time can be seen in Matthew chapter 24, verses 6 to 8. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Every single one of the natural signs mentioned can be observed in abundant measure in our world today. Moreover, there is a noticeable trend of these signs intensifying. They are akin to birth pains. Additionally, we are witnessing an increase in spiritual signs of the end times, characterized by the emergence of more false teachers, New Age churches, cultic groups, heresies and occult practices, all of which are on the rise. Societal indicators of the last days are also evident, with immorality becoming rampant and perversion increasingly accepted. Immorality has, quite literally, become the foundation of society. Indeed, the signs of the end times surround us, yet we must refrain from setting dates. The world is undergoing significant changes, and a sense of uncertainty pervades the air. People are living in fear amid a palpable cloud of uncertainty and apprehension, partly because it often seems as if we are on the brink of economic collapse. At times, it feels as though the world itself is on the verge of ending. Prolonged exposure to news broadcasts can exacerbate these feelings, as the media tends to focus predominantly on negative stories. Turn on the news, and you'll see reports of rising inflation. Turn on the news, and you'll find central banks around the world increasing interest rates. Turn on the news, and you'll be informed of a cost-of-living crisis. Turn on the news, and you'll learn we're facing a significant decline in living standards. Turn on the news, and you will see nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Turn on the news, and you will see famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. Turn on the news, and you will see people are worried. People fear what the future may hold. However, this does not mean Jesus is coming next year. You might be surprised by the number of people who have predicted the year of Jesus' return and were mistaken. Do not heed anyone's prediction. They are incorrect. No one possesses any insider information. Even if someone claims an angel revealed to them the date of his coming, they are mistaken. This pattern has repeated itself throughout history. For instance, in the year 12 and 13, the Crusade prophecy occurred. In 1988, a prophecy concerning the rapture of the church circulated widely. Edgar C. Wisenant confidently proclaimed that Jesus would return in 1988, stating, only if the Bible is in error am I wrong. He distributed 300,000 copies of his book, 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Be in 1988, to pastors across the United States for free. 
Eventually, 4.5 million copies were sold and Edgar garnered a significant following worldwide. During World War II, a catalog of preachers pointed to Adolf Hitler as being the Antichrist. Can you imagine how people living in World War II were convinced that Jesus was coming at any moment? Imagine how close to the end it must have felt for them, living through World War II and witnessing a figure from Europe attempting to take over the world. Believers living in this period must have thought the rapture was definitely about to happen any minute. Can you imagine what they must have gone through? And yet, 77 years have passed since the end of World War II, and the rapture has not yet taken place. Jesus has not yet returned. Why? Matthew 24, 36. But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Yes, we are witnessing the signs, but an essential truth about God must be remembered. God is beyond our comprehension, not confined to our level of existence. Unlike mortal beings or even celestial ones like angels, God exists from eternity to eternity. He is an eternal entity without beginning or end, not bound by the constraints of time, space, or matter. Consequently, God's prophetic timetable operates according to his sovereign will, not aligned with our biological clocks. It's crucial to respect and honor God, recognizing that his understanding surpasses ours. We are called to fear God, offering him the reverence he rightly deserves. God is answerable to no one. He is known as the Ancient of Days, a title that speaks to his eternal dominion and wisdom. In describing himself in this manner, God reveals his timeless nature and supreme authority over all creation. This understanding invites us to trust in God's timing and plan, acknowledging that his ways and thoughts are higher than ours. As we observe the unfolding of prophetic events, let this perspective guide our response, to live in awe of God's majesty, to submit to his divine timeline, and to worship him with a heart full of reverence and trust. Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. He operates in a realm higher than mine or yours. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. Only God knows when Jesus will return. And no one can predict the date of his coming. 2 Peter 3 verse 8 But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. God is not restricted by time, a concept that is often challenging for us humans to grasp. In our lives, if something doesn't occur within a few years, we might consider it delayed or even missed. However, God operates beyond the temporal limitations that confine us. As stated in 2 Peter 3.8, With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. This passage highlights God's transcendence over time. He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. God encompasses the past, present, and future simultaneously, rendering time irrelevant to his divine existence. He possesses an infinite expanse of time, unfathomable to our finite minds. Expanding on this, if the Lord chooses not to return for another 100,000 years, in God's perspective, that span would only be a 100 days, using a literal interpretation of the scripture from 2 Peter 3, verse 8. This concept underscores the vast difference between divine and human perceptions of time. It serves as a reminder that God's plans unfold according to his perfect timing, not ours. Trusting in God's timing requires faith and patience, acknowledging that his wisdom and plans are far beyond our understanding. This perspective encourages us to live our lives in faithfulness and anticipation, always ready for God's will to manifest yet content in the knowledge that his timing is perfect regardless of our own timelines or expectations. Christ may return today or in a thousand years. What truly matters is that you have a relationship with him because ultimately either he will come here or you will go to be with him. Do you know Christ? Are you seeking him, seeking his face? God extends an invitation to the world to make him their Lord but at the same time, there is a real and serious warning against rejecting such a wonderful gift. 
The invitation from the Lord, Isaiah chapter 55, verses 6 to 7. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. My friends seek the Lord while he can be found. Time is advancing, and with it history unfolds, inscribing its pages with events that lead us towards a significant moment forewarned by the prophet Isaiah. I refer to this warning as wonderful, and you might wonder why. The beauty of Isaiah's warning lies in its implication. God is accessible now. The windows of heaven are open, my friend. You can find God. In the Old Testament era, only the high priest had the privilege of entering the Holy of Holies, and that just once a year. Contrast this with the New Testament era, where every believer is considered a priest, granted not just the opportunity to enter the Holy of Holies, but to dwell there continuously. This shift signifies an unprecedented closeness to God available to every believer. The truly good news is that in this endeavor, you are not alone. The Holy Spirit of God is there to assist you. The role of the Holy Spirit is to guide you towards the Lord, facilitating a deeper, more personal relationship with Him. This divine assistance ensures that as we navigate the complexities of life and faith, we have a constant helper pointing us towards God's presence, enabling us to live in an intimate communion with Him. This transformation from the Old Testament practices to the New Testament reality reflects God's desire for a closer relationship with His people. It underscores the continuous unfolding of God's plan for humanity, inviting us into a life that is deeply intertwined with His presence. Through the Holy Spirit, we are empowered to explore the depths of this relationship, discovering the joy and peace that come from living in close proximity to the divine. John chapter 16, verses 13 to 14. How be it, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. Take your attention of attempting to predict his coming. Live each and every day as if he is coming today or as if you are going to be with the Lord today. It's easy for us to become engrossed in the concerns of the world, particularly amidst the myriad distractions that envelop us. Our focus can intensely center on our jobs, families, hobbies, and personal interests, leading us to overlook that our paramount objective should be to live for God and to ready ourselves for his return. This is the essence of Jesus' caution to remain vigilant and watchful, for his arrival is unpredictable. The scenario of people engaging in their everyday activities upon the Lord's return shouldn't astonish us. Life by its nature progresses, marked by routine activities such as eating, drinking, and marrying. However, it is startling that many will be so absorbed in these ordinary pursuits that they neglect to consider God. This indifference mirrors the demeanor of those during Noah's era who were preoccupied with their lives right up until the flood eradicated them. As Christians, our stance must diverge significantly. We cannot allow worldly concerns to overshadow our spiritual obligations. The devil is adept at ensnaring us in busyness and preoccupations, diminishing our capacity to ponder on God or execute his will. By distracting us with worldly matters, he aims to obstruct our ability to discern and follow God's guidance. Our culture's fixation on material wealth, social media, and entertainment exemplifies the devil's influence, bombarding us with the notion that we must constantly acquire more, achieve more, and adhere to the latest trends. These distractions hinder our focus on what truly matters, our relationship with God, and our mission to disseminate his love. The devil's strategy is to overload us with worldly cares, leaving no room for God in our lives. To counteract this, we must prioritize our spiritual relationship, dedicating time to God amid our hectic schedules. It requires deliberate effort to seek His will and heed His direction, staying aware of potential distractions. Like the days of Noah, where sin was rampant and glorified, our era similarly elevates and venerates sin. 
Recognizing this, we must be vigilant in our commitment to God, ensuring that our lives reflect his teachings and not the transient allurements of the world. The most dangerous thing for a person to do is to get so absorbed with this life, so much so, that they forget that Jesus is coming soon. Matthew chapter 24, verses 37 through 39. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. The people of Noah's generation had a prophet who warned them of the coming flood, and not a single person listened to Noah and his warnings. And you know what amazes me? What amazes me is the reason why these people did not heed the warnings of Noah. The reason why these people did not take heed to the warnings of Noah is not because they were deceived by seducing spirits. It's not as if these people were lost in the doctrines of devils. It's not as if Satan came and covered these people's ears so that they wouldn't hear the message from the prophet Noah. They were consumed by the cares of this world. They were so absorbed, engrossed, and captivated by the cares of this world, so much so, they ignored the warnings of the prophet. The people of Noah's generation were busy, busy, busy eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, and the world will do that to you. It will. It will suck you in to make you too busy for God. The world has such a way to get you so soaked up into this life that you forget about the fact that Jesus is coming soon. Jesus will come when people are going on with their normal business. People will be doing what they always do. People will be involved in their normal everyday activities, not realizing such a momentous event is about to occur. The return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who live in sin will still be living in sin. Those who seek and chase after righteousness will be seeking and chasing after righteousness. This is why holy living is so important, because the day of reckoning is coming, and the world at large, just like the world during the days of Noah, are all heading towards this reckoning. The primary concern of Matthew chapter 24 verses 37 through 39 is highlighting the fact that people will be carrying on their daily business, ignoring God's warnings, just as people did in the days of Noah. But just as the flood was God's means of judgment on those people, so Jesus' return will bring judgment on sinners and salvation to his people. Aside from the fact that people will be focusing on their everyday activities, there are five other similarities to the days of Noah to our day today. Similarity number one, exploding population. Genesis chapter 6 verse 1, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them. During the days of Noah, the population grew at a tremendous rate. In our generation, we can also see rapid growth in the population. The world's population reached 8 billion in 2022, growing by 1 billion in the last 12 years, and reflecting the rapid population spike of the past few decades. With India projected to become the world's most populous country by 2023, surpassing China. While it took hundreds of thousands of years for the world's population to reach 1 billion, the world grew from 7 billion to 8 billion just since 2010, a reflection of the advancements in health. As the world is expected to grow even more to over 10 billion during the next 60 years, as the UN's population division of the Department of Economic and Social Affairs, or DESA, reported. Similarity number two, sexual perversion. Genesis chapter six, verse two. The sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful, and they married any of them they chose. The generation we live is a generation that celebrates sexual perversion and sexual immorality. 
Sex is not evil or bad. It is a wonderful union that God has created for one man and one woman to engage together in the act within a holy marriage. However, our sinful nature attempts to acquire sex outside the constraints of marriage, and our sinful culture attempts to encourage us to have sex outside the constraints of marriage. The parameters of God are as following, one man and one woman married in holy matrimony, and nothing else. Similarity number three, demonic activity or fallen angel activity. Genesis chapter six, verse two, the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful, and they married any of them they chose. In the days of Noah, fallen angels came to the earth and played a very real part in this earth. And this can be seen in our generation. You rarely hear this in modern day Christian churches, but this is the truth the Bible preaches. Evil spirits or demons can actually possess people, dwelling within them and controlling them. Have you ever watched the news and wondered, how can anyone do something so evil? Have you ever said to yourself, I don't understand how any human being can commit a crime so heinous and evil? A possible explanation is that the person is being controlled by an evil spirit. Don't be naive and think for a second that demonic activity ceased to exist in the Bible. In our generation, the days we live in, there is real demonic activity. I remember listening to the testimony of a police officer, and he actually stated that he became a believer in Christ when he first encountered a demon-possessed man. He spoke of one particular arrest when him and six other officers struggled to subdue one man. Seven officers struggling to restrain one man. He stated that the guy looked like a string bean and was the size of a toothbrush but he felt like he had supernatural strength. Seven officers struggled to restrain one man. That is not normal. That is not natural. Do you remember that the demon-possessed man of the Gadarenes, who was possessed by a multitude of demons or legion, had superhuman strength and lived naked among the tombstones? Modern day churches avoid the topic of demons. Jesus didn't. Yet modern day churches just brush the topic of demons under the carpet. Jesus didn't do that. We as the body of Christ need to get to the point where we acknowledge the fact that demons are real. But we need to know that we don't have to live in fear of them. We don't have to live a timid, scared life. No. We see in Colossians chapter 2 verse 15 that Christ has made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross and we submit to God and resist the devil. We have nothing to fear. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Similarity number four, constant evil in the heart of man. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. Isn't it interesting? Isn't it interesting that the level of immorality and corruption in the days of Noah competes with the days we live in? We live in a generation where people call evil good and good evil. Remember what the prophet Isaiah said, Isaiah chapter 5 verse 20, Woe unto them that call evil good, and good evil, that put darkness for light, and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. That is the generation we live in. We live in a generation where preaching the gospel message is classified as evil, but yet songs that encourage sex, drugs, and promiscuous living are glorified. We live in a generation that calls evil good, and good evil. We are moving towards a time where preaching the gospel message of Jesus Christ will be illegal. Mark my words. Do you understand that? We are moving closer to a time where preaching the word of God will be classified as hateful, a godless generation, just like the generation of Noah. Not only is the world like this, but the modern day church. The biggest mistake you can make is comparing your life and your lifestyle 
to other Christians. Other Christians are not your yardstick. The Word of God is your yardstick. There are people who claim to be Christian, but they are just as worldly as the world. And some people look around them and compare themselves to Christians who are lovers of the world, and they believe that they are living holy lives because other church members do what they do. No, compare your life to the Word of God. Examine yourself not to your church's standard, but to God's standard. God's standard is not your pastor. God's standard is not your best friend at church. God's standard is not your brother or sister. God's standard is the Word of God. Once you begin to examine yourself to the Word of God, you will quickly find out that there are things as a Christian you should not watch. There is music as a Christian you should not listen to. There are things I shouldn't do. We live in a generation where there is a constant evil in the heart of man. Similarity number five, widespread corruption and violence. Genesis chapter 6 verse 11. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. Corruption. At every level of society, there is corruption. Just like the generation of Noah. Have you noticed how violent video games are now? Look at some of the video games that are popular today. They are so violent. Have you listened to how violent some of the music that is out there is? The world is filled with violence. You look at the violence that is in the world at large, all the wars in the world. The world was full of violence in the days of Noah. As the days of Noah was, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Jesus pointed out that in the days of Noah, the people were completely and utterly unaware that judgment was coming. And that is like our generation. People are oblivious to the fact that Jesus is coming soon. People are busy living their lives, going to work, coming back home, falling in love and falling out of love, getting married, eating, drinking, commuting, going to the cinema, shopping, sleeping, not knowing that we are moving towards the day of reckoning. It is a sobering thought that the people of Noah's generation did not know that anything was wrong until a flood actually came. Yet they were living their lives as usual.